There are some really simple rules that you follow and you can be successful in developing a power supply system. The difference that I take than other people is my approach is based on the, the actual amount of energy that needs to be moved and my perspective is that m energy moves through plumbing that's created by the conductors of the printed circuit board and the dielectric. The dielectric being the actual medium through which the energy moves. So I look at the amount of energy that is required and I make sure that the capacity of the plumbing to move the energy matches the requirement. And that's a little bit different than what everybody else looks at. And uh, my power supply designs are successful, <laughs> let's say that. If the impedance is 50 ohms, then I only have the capability for moving a tenth of an amp at each wave cycle because the energy travels in waves. So I have two choices, either to make the capacity larger by lowering the impedance, or I add more pipes to increase the amount of energy each wave cycle. So I would go to, you know, the best solutions seem to be on adding more pipes close to each other so that you can have a concentration of field moving in a small space, but at a much higher rate than if I use a single dielectric. A lot of people think they need to use one ounce copper for their power and ground planes. This is useful if you need that material to dissipate the heat from an IC. They typically use it in power planes because they, I believe it's a result of inadequately designing the, the transmission lines that you use to move the energy. What happens in improperly designed power systems is a lot of the energy is converted from electromagnetic field into kinetic energy heating up the board uh, conductor material. And so people want to have more copper because it's capable of withstanding more of this thermal interaction. A well-designed power distribution system has very little interaction with the copper because you're not moving so much energy through that space as you are in a poorly designed one. So I don't specify one ounce copper for my power distribution systems because I design them based on the requirement of the power supply and the capability of the transmission lines. If I need more than one transmission line, I add multiple transmission lines and design for the energy movement and I never even consider IR drop or any of the traditional parameters because that doesn't come into the picture if you have the proper plumbing in place. Unfortunately, the simulation tools that are available today really don't evaluate the printed circuit board design from the perspective of the basic rules of electromagnetic field management, which is to ensure that there is one dielectric between each of the signal conductors and the ground. They, they don't look at that three-dimensional structure and see if the plumbing is intact. So all of my design analysis is done by just simply looking through the board stack and looking at the traces and helping to ensure that in, from the load to the switch, I can see an unbroken dielectric that's bounded by an unbroken conductor, ground, and the switched conductor, the signal control or the power regulator interface. There has to be an unbroken path through all three dimensions for the energy to move through. If that's not true, then you have signal integrity issues. No tool evaluates the design from that perspective. And unfortunately, no company who does simulation tools has a plan to provide such a tool. It basically needs the ability to do a finite element analysis of the design. And if that was available, the number of boards and systems that fail EMC would be reduced dramatically. Signal integrity and EMC are directly a, a result of the design of the transmission lines that are used for moving the signals. A quick definition of a transmission line is 
two conductors separated by a dielectric. It, it's not, some people jump to the idea of a controlled impedance transmission line. Well, that is a transmission line, but it's a special use case. The EMC and signal integrity are created or destroyed by the wave front. When you turn on a switch, it starts a movement of field energy into the new space. So it's not turning on a switch and current flowing in the conductors, it's turning on a switch and allowing the field that's behind the switch to move into a new space. It does so sequentially, like water moving into an empty hose. The front of that wave is where all of the action happens. The, the displacement current creates all of the noise. And depending on the switching speed of the device and how well the geometry of the transmission line matches that wave front determines whether or not you will have any radiated emissions issues or signal integrity issues. If you have a one nanosecond switching event, then you need to make sure that you have a transmission line that is structured to accept that wave. Reflection, so any EMC or crosstalk occurs during the wave transmit, transition. The ideal transmission line allows for a single wave after the switch is turned on to completely fill the space with the new field density, the voltage. If there is a mismatch, then you will start to get reflections because the energy will not be able to uh, be absorbed by the load and that energy piles up and reflects back, adding another wave. So you get more waves happening and that starts the ringing so that the uh, energy hits the receiver, returns back to the driver, can't go back to the driver, returns back to the receiver, so you get this succession of waves in a system that you don't want waves in and that energy will continue to ring back and forth until it's either converted into heat as it interacts with the molecules of the dielectric and the molecules of the conductor. Some of it finally is absorbed by the receiver but a great deal of it is radiated into the dielectric in the surrounding circuit crosstalk. The, the greater challenges posed by the automotive designs are a few. One is the extreme temperature range that these systems must operate in. We're looking at systems that must function properly between minus 40 as high as 125 or 120, 135 degrees C. So that makes for a challenge itself. The uh, rated emissions specifications are extremely tight because of the continued addition of radio receivers in the vehicles, both the traditional AM, FM bands, the this, this Sirius networks, and now with uh, Bluetooth, then you've got uh, cell phones in the vehicles, so you have to have a very low radiate emissions. The other side is they have a much higher uh, susceptibility requirement because they put transmitters all over the car now. And so that challenge is, is what really is my focus on a daily basis, is to design a low cost, and low cost, I'm sorry. The focus in automotive is always low cost because the, the volume of the modules is very high. Millions and millions of each of these types of controllers designed so that they want to reduce the cost. So I work with them in one of the classes I teach is called Effective PCB Design. And the idea is to take the materials that have been uh, selected for their cost model, that we can use them effectively to achieve the goal of full EMC compliance and the performance they require for the application. The PCB materials that we use in automotive are primarily the standard FR4 type materials. I don't know of very many uh, special use cases where a different material is used. There are some sub-modules because now we have radar all over the car, and but they use as traditional materials and traditional manufacturing technologies they can. They're not real excited about HDI or blind and buried vias and using any special materials such as the, the high decay materials. Uh, there are starting to become a few higher performance modules. There, there now has been a crossover point where connectors 
have come down in price and they will do a, a motherboard with a four or six layer traditional manufacturing and a couple of connectors to a CPU board with a high performance you know, quad core gigahertz processor and external memory. And because size is important, they might in those cases use the HDI or blind vias. Managing the temperature changes in the circuit board are extremely difficult and they very rarely will do anything special to cool the electronics. The, uh, the best I see is in the audio realm where the power amplifiers will be uh, mounted against the metal case of the radio and they will use that as the heat dissipation engine. In most of the controllers they may or may not take the power driver transistors for the ignition system, for example, and mount them against the metal case as well. But as a general rule, your electronics must just live in the environment, which is why the high T, 135 degrees C is pretty high. Yeah. There is a lot of dream in their, their next, their future, is they would like to embed the electronics into the machines. So they would like to put the transmission controller in the transmission. They would like to put the engine controller in the engine. So they're always pushing the semiconductor and other companies to come up with solutions that can live at, at higher and higher temperatures. Wow. That's so the silicon on sapphire and some of the other things may become attractive at some point in time. Mm -hmm. wow. the, as, as the vehicles start to add more and more data collection mm -hmm. systems, both the cameras, the sonars, the radars, the LIDARs, the big challenge is how do you move that data from the, from the sensor node into an environment where they can process that data and do their item or object recognition and in pursuit of the autonomous vehicle world. They are pursuing high speed ethernets in the vehicles. We're working with our customers to create uh, ethernet gateway systems that will bring the data. There's an effort now to do some of the pre-processing by putting you know, high power uh, uh, processors at the sensor node so they can reduce the amount of data that needs to be transmitted back to the central processor where the final decisions on driving will be made. Kind of distributed process. Yes, they, there was the, the trend in the years past to bring the processing into a central system, but now they're going the other direction. It's becoming a, a distributed high performance segregated system where each different function is relegated to a different network. So there's the, the vehicle control system is separate from the uh, driver, enhanced driver applications to a separate network and then the infotainment will be on a separate network. Those will all go to a central gateway, and then that gateway will connect them to the communications devices, the, the, blue, the radios, the other ways for the vehicle to talk to the network. And the, the goal is that most of the cars will all talk to each other, and as one car learns not to run over something, they all learn not to run over that same item and shared intelligence. Ferrite beads and inductors used in control of EMC issues. That's one of my favorite subjects. Uh -huh. I, early in my career, we worked with a, a consultant on a, on a noise problem for a Chrysler vehicle. And after a couple of months of analysis, they came up with a long list of ferrites and inductors they wanted to add to the controller at an added cost of 10 or $15. Well, that was absolutely unacceptable in the automotive world. You don't ask them to add cost, you show them ways to reduce cost. I never use ferrites and inductors in my designs. I just recently did my first network control board, which is an ethernet gateway. And the, it has a high powered network processor, four gigabytes of DDR4. It has an ethernet controller Ethernet switches, Ethernet FIs, CAN and LIN control interfaces. The reference design that I started with had 28 ferrites and inductors in all of the inputs to the power supply for the main CPU. I took them all off the board. 
I designed it managing the plumbing properly and putting the, the energy storage network where it needed to be in the board pass DMC first pass. I've been working hard to put this perspective into a useful, easy to understand format for a number of years. I teach this in all my classes when I go around the world. Where I can, I teach at industry conferences to make this knowledge available. I teach it directly at my customer sites when I get the opportunity. And all of the NXP uh, technology events, then I teach as well. I, I go around the world to do this. I've learned the, the basic rules because I was fortunate enough to meet Ralph Morrison, who is currently the oldest living EMC engineer. Ralph is 93 years old. Wiley asked him to publish a new book last year, which is now in print. And Ralph decided he was going to make me his apprentice. And I am now, and he was going to teach me electromagnetic field physics, or it was going to kill me. And so I'm still alive. And I actually met with Mr. Morrison on Monday, because we're dear friends now. And, and he made me feel very good, because he said, Dan, I think you understand it now. Wow, all this is subject, <coughs> possibly subject, subject of a new book or something. Like that. It, it could be if I, my wife's always asking me to publish my work, and I, I will someday. Well, okay. Mr. Morrison wrote the first book on EMC. And it was called Grounding and Shielding back in 1967. All of the subsequent EMC engineers always say that they have used that book as a reference. What Ralph has told me is that nobody ever really got the right perspective from what he was trying to tell people, which is very simple. The energy moves in the space between the conductors. They don't teach it that way in school. The methodology that we used for most of my career did not accept that idea. It was connecting wires because electrons carried the energy. Electrons are not involved in energy transfer. It's electromagnetic field, and that doesn't travel in conductors. It travels in the space. We use the conductors to create the boundaries for the field to move in. Requires a revolutionary change of thinking. It takes a complete change of thinking. It took me more than eight years before Ralph would stop yelling at me, because I would say something improperly using the wrong language, and it would would earn me a one-hour lecture on what the physics really was doing. So he's, he's been, uh, the reason I'm successful is because I finally accepted the rules. It's the one dielectric rule. You must have only one dielectric for each signal. You can't put multiple signals in the same space or they become well connected. It's crosstalk. The, uh, the other person who's responsible for my being here today as an instructor is one of the perennial instructors of the uh, PCB West, and that's Rick Hartley. Oh, yeah. he, the f my first experience with the signal integrity class was about 12 years ago when I came to PCB West for the first time and took a signal integrity class that Rick was teaching. And I had no idea when I came. I was a senior engineer. I designed 68020 emulators. Oh. So I was at the peak of my game. I was in the process of designing a pre-silicon emulator with Gatorade-based IP and was in, directed by my PC board design team to go get some learning because I didn't know what I was doing. And it was only about 15 minutes into Rick's class that I came to the realization that I had Every design I'd ever done worked by accident, not by purpose. <laughs> and as a senior engineer, that was a very humbling moment. So my job is solutions. I'm an applications engineer. I have to find out what it is, how to make it work, to help enable my customers to be successful. So that started me to pursue the knowledge and led to subsequently my meeting Mr. Morrison and saying the right bad things to have him take mercy, have mercy on me and teach me physics. So I've been able to extract the simple rules that are behind 
all of the very high level mathematics. You don't need to understand that to do good PC board designs. You just need to understand that you're a plumber now. You're designing pipes for energy to move in. I want to take a moment to, to talk about the current state of the industry in electronics and the impact that the proper understanding can have. If you design systems based on the actual physics involved, you can design a system that will be compliant, both from a signal integrity perspective and from an EMC perspective. The physics of electronics is, very, is quite simple if you just follow the rules. The problem is most people don't understand what they do for a living. Is we design, manufacture systems that generate, manage, and consume electromagnetic field energy. You can only do three things with electromagnetic field energy. You can store it, you can move it, or you can convert it to kinetic energy. It's all threes. And when you start to think of things in that perspective, it all becomes a lot more, a lot simpler. The problem is that people want it to be complicated. And as a result, especially driven by the changes in IC geometry and the increased uh, difficulty of passing the EMC standards as they continue to become more and more stringent across a wider band of frequencies, it's the status quo for the industry has become failure. That everybody expects to fail EMC, that they design the module and don't feel confident that it will behave properly. And this is well known and unfortunately accepted. The problem is nobody budgets for redoing the modules, both from a time perspective or from a cost perspective. So they end up in a situation where they have to do the new design in an expedited manner, they have to pay expedite charges for materials to fabricate the new boards, to manufacture the new boards, beg for time in the test chambers, and do it over again with no confidence that it's going to pass the second or third or fourth time. I work with customers, they always come to me after they've failed two or three times. And usually the solutions are very simple. Most of my board analysis time is about three or five minutes. Typically, I get to the board stack and I'm done. Because that, if not done properly, enables you to violate the rules instantly. So what has to happen, and I want to challenge the whole industry, that we can't continue to do this. That is not engineering. That is children playing in a sandbox. Engineering is where you come up with a method and a solution. We have to take the physics of electronics and we have to create systems that manage it properly. And the status quo can't continue to be, we're going to fail. It has to start to become, we are going to pass. And that comes from the knowledge that you follow the rules, but you actually have to accept those rules. We have to start teaching the rules in school and we have to start getting the engineering teams around the world into the proper training so that we don't have continued failure. This is not okay. Hundreds of millions of dollars are wasted every year building boards they know that will not pass compliance. They don't know whether they'll pass or not. They, I, ask my, I ask people, when you send your board back for the second test or the third test, do you feel confident that it's going to pass? The answer is always no. But following the rules that I've learned working with Mr. Morrison, when I send my system off for testing, I don't think about it again. This I know I follow the rules and it's going to pass EMC. This is unintelligent empirism. It's very simple rules. I don't, I'm not very smart. I just figured out how to put my tinker toys oh, together. Right.